Thank you everyone so much for coming today. My name is Kimmy Vo, Vietnam Society's Director of Communications and Outreach, and I'm privileged to welcome you all today to our penultimate event of Vietnam Week 2023. This conversation really embodies our theme of authentic voices, bridging generations, and it's my honor to introduce our executive director and co-founder of Vietnam Society, Erin Fung Steinhauer, to say a few words about our event tonight, Past and Future, Bridging Generations. Distinguished guests, esteemed panelists and friends, welcome to this momentous gathering co-hosted by the U.S. Institute of Peace and Vietnam Society, an evening that embodies the spirit of dialogue, reflection, and reconciliation. We have come together under the roof of the U.S. Institute of Peace to embark upon a journey of understanding, compassion, and healing. Tonight, we unite the voices of the past and the present, aiming to eliminate the shared histories and complex narratives that have shaped the Vietnamese American and Vietnamese national experiences. Our purpose of tonight is twofold. It is to honor the past and the toll that the Vietnam War extracted on individuals, families, lands, environment, and communities. At the same time, we gather to acknowledge the progress that has been made since the end of the war, recognizing the resilience, unity, and tireless efforts that uh, were put in to rebuild and forge ahead. This event is the opening chord of symphony of conversations uh, on reconciliation and introduce a series of discussions that seek to bridge divides, illuminate perspectives, and heal generational wounds. Through these authentic conversations, we hope to empower all of our participants here, as well as watching online, to be part of the solution for identifying pathways forward towards a united and stronger global Vietnamese community. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and please enjoy our event. Xin cảm ơn chị Erin và chào mừng tất cả các quý vị. Welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. Uh, USIP is a independent, nonpartisan public institution founded by the U.S. Congress in 1984. And the formation of the Institute was due in large part to the efforts of US veterans from World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam War, who wanted to uh, put peace building into the center of, of US uh, policy and practice overseas. So USIP works to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflicts around the world. Um, our work on Vietnam is mostly in that third category. Now, almost 50 years after the end of the war, uh, we started several years ago with a Vietnam War Legacies and Reconciliation Initiative, um, aiming to work both on the physical legacies of war, um, missing people from all sides of the war, Agent Orange, uh, landmines, and unexploded ordnance, and also on the issues of reconciliation um, between Americans and Vietnamese and within each of our countries. Uh, so it's with that focus that uh, we are delighted to be partnering with the Vietnam Society and Vietnam Week for tonight's event, uh, which is a discussion about reconciliation from different Vietnamese perspectives. Um, and it's my honor to moderate this um, along with Lely Hayslip, Kenneth Nguyen, and Long Chan. Uh, and I'd like to ask each of you all to briefly introduce yourselves and share about your connection to Vietnamese communities. Go Lely. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having us here. I mean, what an honor uh, at Vietnamese. We can be right here in the capital of the United States and in a building 
that peace that we want is so much to have. And uh, secondly, I'm um, just very uh, happy to see so many people involved with it because um, it's a, a long uh, journey, but we're on here. So my name is Lely Hayslip. My name is Troublemaker. So I can make trouble, and I'm able to look for the healing and uh, move on for the next generation as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Kenneth Wynn. I'm the host of the Vietnamese podcast. Thank you so much, Aaron and Peter Steinhauer um, and Vietnam Society for inviting us all here. And thank you to the US uh, Institute of Peace and Andrew, thank you. Um, I started the podcast um, because I was very unsure of where I fit in into the whole picture. And the shame that I had coming into the legacy of war and the position that the people in my generation had, it, it sometimes we just don't have this uh, firm ground to walk on. So I just began to develop this uh, question of who we are. And that's my connection to, to the community. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Long Tran. Um, I'm currently a professor at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University. Uh, and first of all, just like uh, Ko Lee, and again, I would like to say thanks um, to uh, Vietnam Society as well as USIP for this great opportunity. Uh, it's uh, such an honor uh, for me to be here um, in this room with so many people that I've admired for a long time. Uh, like Colette Lee and Ken, um, Aaron and Peter uh, and, and Ted for your, um, and many others for your great work and contribution to Vietnam. Uh, to answer your questions, uh, Andrew, I, I think I have a pretty deep connection to Vietnam because I was born and raised uh, in Hanoi, Vietnam. And uh, I spent the first uh, 20 plus years of my life there. Um, and uh, after that, I just, um, had this opportunity to come to the U.S. to study, and then one thing led to another, and uh, now I'm a U.S. permanent resident um, working and even starting a family uh, in Ohio. But uh, uh, most of my family members are still in Vietnam, um, and I'm, a Viet I'm still a Vietnamese citizen, so I, I do try to travel to Vietnam pretty often. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm going there in just a few weeks for a research conference. So, so yes, yeah, so that's all to say that I still have a pretty deep connection to the country. Great, thanks a lot. So the format of our discussion will be first uh, I will ask and we'll discuss some with, uh, with our panelists and then we will open up for questions um, from the audience. So please uh, prepare for that in about half an hour. Um, but let me start with you, Kole Lee. Uh, several days ago, my wife and I had the chance to uh, watch Heaven and Earth and hear you speak along with Ambassador Osius at the Kennedy Center and we knew the story, but we were struck by how much you experienced at a young age in the war and you know, the trauma from, from all sides. It seemed like everything possible happened to you. And yet, after the war, you forgave and worked with people from all sides. Uh, so how do you understand reconciliation and what made it possible for you to understand and forgive in that way? Well, first, uh, I am Vietnamese, but I'm married to American. Uh, my two sons is uh, half and half. Mm -hmm. And so that is uh, God create man and woman uh, uh, create the light carry forward. And if I not forgiving or not uh, really moving on, uh, who would I again? I mean, everybody come to Vietnam, they try to do what they think they did the right thing. Um, they try their very best to steal a life. Um, a Vietnamese, you know, we didn't want them there. If they would add us, uh, we want them there or not, we would say, no, go home with your family and leave us alone. But nobody asked, so therefore, um, we just live with it and we get along with everybody so that we can have another day of life and a ball of rice. So when I get to know to American and overcome my scary day with the look and all those things, uh, I marry to them and come here. Um, I educated myself here. Um, 
U.S. gave me a lot of opportunity for me and my children. Uh, this country offers uh, not only Vietnamese, but many, many uh, different uh, people from around the world. Um, it's a good melting pot for us to come here and be who we want to be. This country gives us freedom of speech, freedom of um, press, freedom of religions, and be whatever that you want to become. This to me, if I don't forgive, and if I don't move on, and if I don't take advantage of it, I would lose. I need to move on. I need to forgive myself and everybody around me um, help me create it who I am today. So forgiveness is Vietnamese. Forgiveness is a part of Buddhism. Forgiveness, forgiveness that we thought by the Confucius, uh, Taoism, uh, Buddhism, um, and a family tradition. And you know, so it's just nothing new or it's nothing that you cannot do. Uh, if I hate somebody, who would I hate? Everybody is human being, just like I said the other day. And the war, it happened. People like myself or my family or villagers, we don't know who started. We don't know who signed the agreement. We don't know what's going on. We just at a wisdom. And every man and woman came to our land is also a war wisdom. So we look at that uh, point of view. We can able to easy to let it be and move on and do our best and turn around and help others. Before I work in for a non-profit or get to involved in um, help Vietnamese for people in Vietnam, I know nothing about politics. I know nothing about embargoes. I know nothing about what I can and cannot do uh, because of the US and Vietnam have no normalization. But when I started to apply the visa or apply the paperwork and apply the, um, the right paperwork to carry the money from the U.S. to work in Vietnam back in 1989, that is when I learned about we have to reconcile. Um, there are a story just like this. Is, um, every time I try to, the, the United, well, you know about, we have to have three licenses to work in Vietnam back to, back in the day. And so one day I carry $50,000 cash in my purse. And I come into the uh, Los Angeles airport and when, you know, I have all the paperwork and everything, so I'm okay. But then when you have one foot on the ground and another foot in the airplane, that is when I've been stopped it by the um, security. And first question is, where are you going? I said, Vietnam. Are you take any money with you? Yes. How much? It's 50000 And she just froze. She said, you know, you cannot take this money to the common country. And this money has to be here in the United States. But then I reached in my foot and I gave her all the licenses that I had from State Department, from um, Commerce Department, and uh, affair, uh, from, uh, Foreign Affair Office, all of those things. But then she just so happy, she took stand up and she said, this woman do a right thing, she's legal. The first woman, first person legal. Oh, I mean, you know, the whole airplane had to sit there and wait for them to count everything I carry. But that is, I say, okay, so everything has to do legally this way. So that is, it start to learn as I go. And for, before I went back to Vietnam in 1986, I called State Department three times. They said, no, you cannot go to Vietnam. We have no diplomatic with Vietnam if you uh, stuck there and come and put you in jail. No way we can get you out from Vietnam. So no, you cannot go to Vietnam. But after I hang up the phone, I keep asking, who come out with this law? Why is it I cannot go to see my mom? It's so easy. Everybody can come here, but why can I not go there? I mean, you're not just very stupid, didn't think about law, thinking about love thinking about homesick, thinking about meet my mom and want to go to see her. But after I left and 
FBI come and I come back and my children pick me up at the airport and they say, Mom, the FBI want you to call them. And I thought they're just kidding. And uh, so I call and they say, we want to talk to you. And I say, okay. So I own a restaurant. I brought home some fortune cookie and tea for FBI. And so, <laughs> and so we, we had tea and cookie and um, we talked. And so again, three questions. Where you been? Vietnam. Why? Why not Vietnam? Who do you see there? My mom, my sister. And I don't need to say it. I have a brother. And, uh, he's, and I told him, oh, I want to go back to help Vietnamese people because they are so poor and they need help. And he just said, oh, if you want to go and help Vietnamese people, we can help you. You have no idea how happy I was. And he just said, yeah, we can help you. Two of them, very handsome, young, and good looking. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm more cookie, more tea, OK? <laughs> and so he said, OK, um, we help you to go to Vietnam, but you have to bring up something, uh, bring back something for us. And I thought, OK, love letter. I thought, first thing, it's love letter from between man and woman, you know. And OK, oh, yeah, I do anything. And so first, if you bring back for us and tell us what the country is like today and how the communists run the country. That's one. Two, tell us what happened on the military supply and equipment that U.S. left behind. And three, tell us how the, how many Russia would run Vietnam. And I look at him, I say, I can't do that. I, I don't know how to read and write that well. I can't do that. He said, oh, you don't have to do it. Tell your family and friend do it. And they give it to you, and you bring it back to us. And I was thinking, oh, so what do you want me to do? And he said, just do that. And I said, you ask me to be a spy? One say no, no, the one say yes, something like that. <laughs> so now we have a comprehensive strategic partnership, and it's, it's, all, it's all based on, on your experiences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then that is when I thought, I said, you know what? You want me to be a spy, and you want me to create a war, but I want peace. You know, you American, I'm Vietnamese. You men, I'm a woman. You want Hatred, I like to have compassion. So let me bring Vietnam and U.S. together without doing or being spy for you. So here's some more cookie and go. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is when they left and they're very unhappy with me. But that is what made me think mm -hmm. about how to bring the two nations together and how we can live with one another without have so much Hatred, and uh, what I'm so proud to say that Vietnamese, I brought so many uh, U.S. Vietnam veterans and their family back to Vietnam for the last 35 years. And Vietnamese opened up their arms and welcomed them in their home for tea, and no matter how poor or no matter how uh, hard life they had, they still show very happy and very generous to the veterans. And the veteran on the other way hand are just so surprised. How can these people forgive us? How can these people not have any again us? I mean, all this, it makes me very proud to be Vietnamese and very proud what we try to build the road and the path so people can walk on it so that can connect them between two countries. Great. Let me turn to Lam. Uh, you grew up in Vietnam at a time that uh, you know, these changes were happening and the country was opening and starting to have relations with the U.S. How, how have your perceptions changed over time now that you're in the U.S., both of Vietnam and this country? Yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting question, Andrew. Um, so I guess uh, as someone who spent the first 20 plus years of my life in Vietnam and then the last, um, the most recent 10 years here in the U.S., I think my perceptions of both Vietnam and the U.S. have evolved quite a lot. Um, so, um, so uh, back when I was in Vietnam, well, I definitely thought of Vietnam, obviously, as my homeland. And I, I think I, I kind of thought of the U.S. as this faraway um, dreamland uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, tied to what Cole Lee just shared, when I grew up in the, in the 90s and, and the 2000s, the war already seemed like such a, a distant past. Um, and almost everyone around me 
talk about the U.S. with such uh, excitement and, and admiration sometimes and, and without any resentment. And it was, it was not just my family, it was, it was really almost everyone around me, which kind of makes sense because I later learned through a, a survey that uh, people in Vietnam, uh, they, they turned out to have the most favorable view of the U.S. Uh, among almost any other countries. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if there, are any, if there are any other countries out there where people, where a lot of people seem to love President Trump and President Obama like equally. Um, <laughs> Definitely not the case here, as I have experienced. Um, but anyways, because of that, uh, I, I had a very favorable view of the, U of the U.S. as well. Um, and then um, I was just really lucky to be offered a uh, full scholarship to be able to come to the U.S. to do my master's. And then I was uh, just really lucky again and again um, to receive a Ph.D. offer and then a, uh, eventually a, a job offer uh, as for a faculty position at Ohio State, where I'm working these days. Um, and uh, Ohio has, has given me not just a really good job, but also uh, a new family because I, I was lucky to, uh, to, uh, to meet my wife soon after I moved to Ohio. And uh, I think my wife, uh, Paige, she's a really good example actually of uh, U.S.-Vietnam uh, reconciliation because she's, a, she's, a, she's an Ohio girl who knew almost nothing about Vietnam uh, except for some horrible stories about the Vietnam War. Uh, but then after she met me, she has come to... Uh, to learn a lot and to love so much about Vietnam. So she, she loves traveling to Vietnam. She loves my family in Vietnam. Uh, she's a big fan of Vietnamese music, uh, including the very recently uh, popular uh, rap Viet shows. Uh, she, she absolutely loves Vietnamese food. She, uh, she, uh, she wants to go to Hương Viet, which is our favorite uh, local Vietnamese restaurant um, all the time. And she even makes her own chicken pho, pho ga uh, almost every month. Um, so I guess uh, because of all of that, uh, these days I, I, uh, I kind of see the U.S. and Vietnam as both kind of home-ish. And I, I guess I had to say ish because although I love both countries, um, as an immigrant who has been here for 10 years, I think I've changed enough that I, I can no longer feel truly at home, whether I'm in Vietnam or the U.S. Um, but having said that, I think it's, it's, it's okay and it's, it's normal. It's a case for many immigrants, I think, especially first-gen uh, immigrants. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of a story of how my perceptions of the two countries have, I guess, evolved over time. Thanks. So Kenneth, you work in media. You have a podcast that gives you the opportunity to interview many people and learn about their identity like one recently with Aaron Steinhauer from Vietnam Society. Uh, how has that helped your own identity to grow and change? Um, and and how, is, how is that connected with the Vietnamese community in the US? You know, I was born in Pennsylvania. And growing up, I always had this narrative that uh, Vietnam is bad, or the government's bad. Mm -hmm. And the people, the Vietnamese American first generation is good. And I just continued that narrative, right? That programming kept going. And then I joined the Marine Corps uh, in 1993. I served in the Marines for four years. And when I got out, I realized the narratives inside the military just didn't sit well with me as well. And so I started to question. And so I got to USC, studied anthropology and film. I started to question. Um, my position, do I sit on the side of my parents or do I sit on the side of this emerging homeland? And I, I, I still couldn't figure it out. But I start to think about my grandfather who was killed by the Viet Minh. And we had uh, four or five uncle, my, my dad's cousins and, and, and brothers uh, did time in the re-education camp. My father was also in the military. But why am I not feeling the emotions that these people are feeling? Why do I not feel the hatred and the anger towards the people who did this to? And I thought about my time in the military. There are no black and white answers. And so I started to figure out that maybe there's no black and white narratives in the Vietnamese community. So let's start with just one person at a time 
and getting to know people at a time. So my base is, is in the film business, in the Vietnamese film business. Um, in the late 90s, I was friends with all, all of the big filmmakers, the big directors today. And they, um, they took me under their wing, and we partied a lot, and we hung out together. And I got a glimpse of how writers, directors, actors uh, in the Vietnamese space lived. So they let me in and, and, and tell stories. And they're, they're such good storytellers, obviously. And I thought to myself, one day, I'm going to write biographies for all the, the directors. Uh, I, in Vietnam. In, in the US. In the US. In, at USC, UCLA, right. and Loyola Marymount, the, the three big universities that produce these filmmakers. And I said, I'm friends with all of them. I'm going to write their biographies one day. And I, that was just in the back of my mind. I'm so curious about how these visions of these artists become. So um, I said to myself, one day when I'm able to record this, I'm going to record it. And the, then podcasting emerged. And I said, I will start within the film community because they're, they're storytellers. So I started there and then branched out slowly. And everybody started to make um, introductions for me. And that's how I got started with uh, getting to know the Vietnamese uh, stories throughout the, the world. And how does the podcast then uh, bring out stories of trauma and healing? And how do you see that changing since you started? Some people cannot let go. Some people, and, and young people too, I'm talking in their 20s and 30s, some people cannot let go. And some older people in their 80s uh, have never had pain. It's really contextual. And I think everybody's different. Um, and so I, I've no longer held on to this belief that the older generation needs to die off, uh, or the younger generation is going to uh, step up and, and change the world. Uh, I think it's really a case by case. Uh, it's very nuanced. And I think the stories that come out of each individual's ideas and, and creativity is actually the force of change. Like Aaron and Peter, the way this is all unfolding this week, I'm beginning to see the story that Peter told me about the churches in, um, in Ninben is mind-blowing because I, I'm now uh, softer as it comes to uh, issues that deal with the French and colonialism and Catholicism because I, I really hate those things. I hate being colonized, you know, the idea of being colonized at one point, but now I'm softening up because I get to interact with the stories that come from our communities. And I think the more stories we are able to hear, the more reconciliation we can have in our hearts. So there are different views generationally, politically, and culturally within Vietnamese communities. Um, Ko Le Li, how do you interact with people who have different views from yours, who might even protest uh, where, when you're speaking? For the last 45 years now, it was, this, it was a lonely road. Mm -hmm. I, um, wherever I go, I've been protest, call name. Um, every sick people put a uh, sit, they have a flyer, call me communist, how many Americans I kill and all that stuff. But what can I do? Many of them, only one of me. And only thing I can do is be smile very friendly, sing them some song, um, tell the good story about the um, countryside growing up, mm -hmm. and let them take it home with them and think about it. But uh, nothing I can, you know. However, um, it's a very sad, some story is very sad, for example. In San Diego, we have that big, big park called Balbo Park. And in there, they had a uh, international houses for people uh, different country have a different house so that they can show their culture. And so 1993, 94, we got the movie come out and everything, and I just walk in there and I say, I would like to have a house for Vietnam, for Vietnamese community can come and see the culture. Right away, I get the permission, yes, you can have a house for Vietnam because we need it. So I'm so happy. And as soon as they gave it to me, everything, I've been on a newspaper. And then they know the group of Vietnamese come and stop, say, no, you cannot help her uh, have that house because then she's going to bring commoners here, and then she can have a commoner flat here, so therefore, no. So we have a big debate on, then I just walk away. So that is 30 years ago. Last month, 
I just wanted to do something for 2025. It's going to be 50 years anniversary of the Vietnam the war ended, so now we're going to do something nice for the community, for the Vietnamese. So here I live in San Diego for 53 years. I worked in the NAND for the last 35 years. I want to bring the two cities together. And so first I want the University of San Diego and the NAND University to be to get to uh, working together. Then the post uh, in San Diego Post and the NAND Post it should be also a friendship. But then we can have a friendship a relationship, then we can have a sister city three, five years from now. So I signed up a young Vietnamese named uh, Dan who helped me and who organized all this call and meeting and get everything going. And then about two weeks ago, and he called and he said, Go ơi, I cannot talk to you anymore, I cannot see you anymore, and I cannot help you anymore because the community tell me that I am communist now and they don't want me to get involved with you or anything to do with Vietnam. And so they come to my boss and they tell my boss that now I am communist. And my boss called me up and say, ask me, did I want a job? I want to live here in San Diego? Or I want to go with Lily Hesley? And now uh, he said, I, I cannot talk to you, I cannot see you because I want my job and I want to live here in San Diego. You talking about here, in 1966, that is how I remember, that's how it was like. Now, here I am, 53 years, live in San Diego, 2023. And yet, it's still the same back in 1966 in my village. You know, back in those days, they have a word they call the Tô Cộng. And now it's called Chấm Cộng, it's the same thing. But so everywhere I go this year, twice. I, my lecture is being protest and being, you know, still have a lot of the hatred and carry around. So I am only say that it, everybody have their own mission to do. Everyone has their own uh, path to walk on and how they walk it up to them. I just only ask, leave me alone so I can do my work. So I can work on my mission and I do whatever that I need to do while I'm on this earth. I don't bother them and they don't bother me and just that's all I'm asking. And if they can give me that, I will be happy to do more for the community and for the two countries. Well, how does that look from your perspective in Ohio? Do you see Vietnamese nationals and Vietnamese Americans working together? How is the does the community have a shared understanding and vision? Um, I would say not so much in Ohio as I can mm -hmm. see, um, mainly because we don't really have a large Vietnamese community in, in Ohio in, in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I could really relate to what Ko uh, lately just said uh, just now. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's very important, but also really challenging. Uh, and I, I think that the answer uh, might also vary uh, a lot by, by individuals like and, and Ken uh, hinted at. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like for a lot of um, people, it's just the main challenge is just a, a lack of opportunities for, for interactions and, and for, for mutual learning. And I think this ap applies a lot to uh, places, w again, without a, a large Vietnamese community like, like Ohio, where I'm uh, working at. Um, so for, for, for many people, I think it just having uh, more opportunities um, for, for, for more interactions and, and learning would make a, a big difference. Um, so so for, the, for the Vietnamese national side, then uh, so many Vietnamese students, uh, including myself, have had the a privilege of coming here and, and studying here in the US. And, and, and through the process, so many ties have been created. And I'm sure the, the, the same uh, story applies to the uh, Vietnamese American side as well. Uh, so, uh, actually, for example, uh, um, Anh uh, Hong Phong, <laughs> a good friend of mine in the DMV area, recently uh, told me about this amazing uh, summer camp um, that allowed his, one of his daughters uh, to, uh, along with uh, hundreds of other uh, uh, young adults uh, with Vietnamese origins from all over the world to come to Vietnam and to visit Vietnam and to interact with Vietnamese people and to uh, reconnect with the heritage and uh, 
uh, I think that's a, that's a great example of, of how, to, how to connect people. Having said that, I, uh, I, I would also say that it's, it's not always that easy. Um, I think for, for many people, especially those who have been directly hurt uh, in some way by the war, uh, the process of healing and reconciliation and collaboration could be a lot more challenging. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I think it's, it's, it's not easy at all to be someone like, like Colette Lee, who, who managed to uh, overcome her, her personal pain and losses and managed to contribute so much to, uh, um, to reconciliation through her novels, uh, as well as through her humanitarian work. Um, so, so, I mean, if someone could, could learn from Colette Lee and, 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 and see her as, as a ex good example, then that, that's wonderful. Um, but um, I think if, if someone just can't move on from a painful past, uh, I think it's also uh, okay uh, for us to, uh, to try to, to understand and to, and to respect their decision as long as they uh, don't do anything to hurt other people's efforts to, to heal and to reconcile. Uh, and I guess, well, uh, as for advice for, for, for those people who really trying to move on from a painful past and to, uh, to contribute and to, to start this process of reconciliation is challenging, but I, I think there's a lot of great lessons to be learned from a, a book that I actually uh, read recently uh, uh, entitled Nothing is Impossible in uh, <laughs> author by uh, Ambassador Ted Osius. Um, which uh, who I, I believe is going to share with us some great remarks later today. But I myself, for example, learned so much uh, from that book, for example, in terms of uh, how, much, how much work, how much patience, how much empathy uh, it takes for really former enemies to, to rebuild their relationship, to, 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 to regain trust. Um, so yeah, so that, so some, of, some of my thoughts on this very challenging topic. Thank you. So my last question is for Kenneth, and that's our theme here is bridging the past and the future. And how do you see young people in the Vietnamese diaspora and in Vietnam uh, making that bridge? And uh, what are your aspirations for so what that could the, become? The first answer that I have is a very practical answer, which is, young Vietnamese Americans are traveling to Vietnam to do business and to live abroad by the thousands. So there's a lot uh, of that going on. If you go into Orange County, you begin to listen to the wait staff at the Vietnamese restaurants. They're young Vietnamese that come from very um, successful families. What are they doing there? There's a lot of them. It's, it's, it's like, wait a minute, uh, if you were born here, then you probably wouldn't be working or your parents were uh, okay to, to, to not have you work at a Vietnamese restaurant. But many of them are uh, very bright, brilliant uh, faces, very sang sua, as we say in Vietnamese. And you're like, oh, so they're coming from Vietnam as students to, and these are part-time jobs that they have. So there's a lot of them. There's thousands and thousands of them on a practical level that are here. So I think that that change, that exchange is happening uh, on a very practical, and it's changing the fabric of Vietnamese Americans uh, in Vietnam, and it's changing. My brother's been in Vietnam for 20 years. So he was also a US Marine, went to USC, studied film with the, the whole nine, and he's back in Vietnam doing work. Uh, so there is a, a really good bridge that's happening. My aspirations is a little bit complicated because I view uh, Vietnam, the motherland, as my mother, and I view the United States as my father. And they had a divorce in 1975. And it's, it's complicated sometimes, but the love that I have for both of them uh, is something that I want to share with the entire Vietnamese diaspora, as well as Vietnam, Viet, Vietnamese in Vietnam, is that our mother is in Vietnam and our father is around the world. And if we can reconcile that we are one big family that has a lot of issues and a lot of arguments, and it's healthy to do that, it's healthy to have dialogue, it's healthy to talk about communism, it's healthy to talk about pain, and it's also healthy to have Viet joy. 
It's healthy to have the plenitude, as Viet Thanh Nguyen says, the plenitude of storytelling. We should have all of it. Why not? And that's my aspiration for the Vietnamese worldwide, is to have an openness to have the discussions all over. So that's a great note to end on. Uh, and now we can open it up to the big family. Uh, there are a couple of mics that uh, volunteers will pass around. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, do I have to identify myself? Please. Dean Rodan, uh, I work on the Hill. Uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Tran. Uh, so you mentioned like changes in opinions of uh, people from Vietnam about the U.S. And I was wondering, like in your research, have you been able to identify like causes? You know, like whether it was like was it education, was it like media exposure? I'd like to hear thoughts. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I honestly cannot give you a scientific answer because that's not something I, I study. Uh, but uh, I guess just from my um, personal experience, then I, I think it's, uh, it's a function of so many factors uh, that, that led to uh, Vietnamese people's really favorable view of, of the US. Uh, the media definitely played a big role. I, I remember growing up watching so many uh, Hollywood blockbusters and being fascinated with, 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 with uh, <laughs> with, with life uh, in the U.S., uh, which uh, I've become, become a little bit disillusioned if with after I moved to, to the U.S. is, is not as exciting as, as is, is portrayed uh, by Hollywood. Um, and, uh, and then there's also this, this, this factor that uh, I think Cole Lee explained really well. I think it's, it's also, I would say, part of our DNA to, uh, it's kind of, I, I guess, this, this Buddhist uh, influences that, that uh, that led a lot of Vietnamese people more, more easily to, towards uh, the side of, of forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, I know that there's also other factors, like, uh, uh, like earlier I, I mentioned this idea of admiration. So I think a lot of people in Vietnam just, just see the U.S. for a long time as like the, 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 always the front runner uh, when it comes to so many things, just all of the exciting innovations, um, uh, economic development, and so on. So there are a lot of reasons for, for, for people to, to admire the US. Um, and I could go on and on, but I, I guess my point is that there's so many factors there. Thanks, there was one on this side. Just bring the mic down to you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jiao uh, Nguyen. I grew up in this area, this community. So on the concept of uh, reconciliation, uh, Ken, thank you for your story. Mine kind of mimic yours pretty much. So I, th I think within the community itself, within the Vietnamese community in Vietnam and here, there is a lack of a national reconciliation movement within ourselves. Can we give, forgive ourselves? When Can the leadership actually stand up and say, I effed up, policy screwed up? Okay, but can we move on? Can we work together to bring a better Vietnam for tomorrow? Right? I mean, my story is way out there, but still, when I was younger, I was out there, you know, that outcome saying, you name it, I was there. But then I still took the heart to say, I still love Vietnam. I still love the people. I have teams going back there to help the people all the time. I have students getting scholarship, because once they improve, our country improves. Vietnam improves. Right? So I think the, the dialogue that you, we should initiate is a national reconciliation. From, from which side? No, no, it's just from, from the us. US, from the Vietnamese American yes. side? Yes, from us. Because there's a lot of pain and suffering that I've seen it all, right? I've seen a lot. But we still can't jump in there and say, you know, what can we do better? How can we come together and shake hands? As simple as a freaking hello, sometimes they wouldn't even do it. So, it's just a comment, and I think maybe see Ken within your broadcast, podcast, maybe bring that subject up. You know, let's, let's really initiate this conversation for everybody. Well, I, I would like to address that on a practical level. I feel like uh, the people that have moved on, 
or needs to move on or it's in the machine, it's already, it's really already hap has happened. It started many, many years ago. And I think within our own families, we don't get the national memo. But the reality is families like mine have been going back since the 90s. And my family was knee deep in the, in the military. And you know, although there is no talk formally of reconciliation uh, with, at the dinner table, but uh, they've sent their sons back to do business. They, so there's thousands of us that have been going back. So the idea of reconciliation has happened on a very practical level. Um, and it's, it's almost, you know, they've moved on. In reality, they've moved on. They, they don't question. And they're very supportive of the work that we do. And many other families that I know um, that had uh, parents that are you know, at the upper levels, all fine with it. So I, I feel like it, it, it really has, the engine has started 20 years ago um, as people like uh, have been going back for, for a long time now. Hello, uh, my name is Tybin Elston. I work for the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Um, my question is for anyone on the panel, um, how do we know when we're reconciled? Is that like a magic number or a goal that we're shooting for? Or is it kind of an endless process that you know, generation after generation we're gonna have to strive for? Thank you. <laughs> Who would like to take that on? I mean, at, at USIP we talk about reconciliation as a process. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not an end state. It's not something that can just be declared. Um, but yeah, there are ways of looking at how far along we are in that process. Uh, personal relationships, like Ken is saying, is one of the elements, right? Um, having a shared vision, talking about the past and the trauma that uh, people experienced. Um, what do you think? I, I think that's a very multi-layered um, answer because the people that are in power or that are making things happen uh, don't need that reconciliation conversation. But it's the ones that are the downtrodden, the ones that in their minds lost everything and couldn't rebuild. Those are the people that feel like they haven't been in reconciliation mode. But the ones that have moved on uh, are regularly going back and have been doing business in Vietnam for the last two decades and have been able to create legal infrastructures, bring big lawyers back, dig for oil, <laughs> if you name it, they bring technology back, make movies. It, it's endless. So uh, on, on, on one side, you could see how there is not even a need for reconciliation talk. And on the other side is the people that are powerless, the old men that came back broken and into the United States that were once powerful, that have lost everything. Their social construct comes from a completely different place. And that's what we're experiencing, I think, at home at the dinner table. All of this anger, it's really the powerless. But the men who have moved on and were able to switch their mindset, and there are many of them uh, that came from uh, you know, officers of the war that came here and became, uh, you know, went to Berkeley within four years after arriving. There's many stories like that of them not even thinking about the word reconciliation. They've already moved on once they got into a big university or Ivy League uh, as a 35, 40 year old man or went to medical school right after. There's a, there's a lot of stories of that. So it just depends where in the social strata you, you belong. Kole Lee, what do you think? Where are we in the process of reconciliation? Yeah, uh, you ever see your daddy and mommy fight? <laughs> so when they fight, they argue, they upset, everything. You, the person in the middle, you have a right, you have opinion, you have feeling, and you, the one that bring them to calm down and try your best to mindfulness, peacefulness in the house, in the family. And only thing you can do is offer yourself. And you be the model, and you be the best, the citizen on the both sides you can. And that is you can, if you can take care of yourself and everyone around you can see that, and do that, and the society can do that little by little. Everyone can have the same flowing through with the waters, I hope. We have time for several more in the back row. Um, 
my name is Joe, and um, I'm in the local Vietnamese community. Um, I've been organizing for a while, and so I actually know Long from before when he was at American University. And um, I can uh, empathize with Ko, Ko Lee um, Hayslip about, like, you know, what you're saying about, you know, the pain about, like, uh, some folks, they don't, they want to keep the past and they don't want to move on. And um, I guess I'm fortunate that my parents were, like, low level. So, like, I think what you just said, Kenny, about it's the high level folks who couldn't move on. So my dad was just a, literally just a foot soldier. He got on the boat, and I'm here. I was born here. So um, uh, as far as the organizing goes, it, it started pretty hard. I mean, I had a lot of folks who, you know, um, they kind of just want to talk about the past, and they just want to, like, you know, da-da and all that kind of stuff. But And they kind of neglected, like, the local um, you know, community needs as far as, like, um, you know, organizing the community for a chamber of commerce or economic or, or political, you know, benefit for, for all of us in the local community. But, you know, it's starting to change. And I see now that, like, you know, the older generation is going on, not by choice, you know, time doesn't stop. I, I was at a USIP event here and actually shook, shook hands with John McCain in 2015 during the 20-year the anniversary. But, um, yeah, I, I feel your pain. Sometimes I go to, like, um, the local events out here, say like in Eden Center, and I see like there's there's just less of the older generation there. So the future does look bright. It's a little bit tough, but you know I'm kind of happy. Like you know things are moving on. Not, you know America has moved on, and um, I'm just happy. Like you know the folks now we can uh, do it together. At least you know at least for the younger folks who want to move on. Thanks. Would anyone like to respond? Could hear. Okay. Make sure that the mic is on. Any more? Mm -hmm. They let you understand everything we say. <laughs> Can, is this on? Yes. Okay. Oh, I hate my voice in this. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming down here. It's truly an honor um, to to hear your conversation. I want to ask a question about, um, so this is completely a philosophical question, so I want your opinion on this. I had to actually write my question down. Um, so in 2021, um, Vietnam, unfortunately, is known for limiting freedom of speech often. So in 2021, um, the government further limited internet freedom during that year. They pushed toward a draft in July that would restrict live streaming and launching a national code of conduct for people using social media in June. So the right uh, group, Vietnamese Human Rights Network, which I actually follow, um, there's a website that I follow, um, that basically said Facebook, Google, and YouTube um, basically are complying with this new law that just basically the government is escalating demands to censor descendants. So I want to ask all you four up here, do you feel like your voices are much stronger um, outside of Vietnam? Because unfortunately, if there's conversations like this in Vietnam, um, I don't appreciate anyone censoring what I have to say. And from someone who's a big fan of Vietnam and I have visited Vietnam, I don't feel comfortable as a millennial when my Facebook was limited. And I tried to go on TikTok, and I was trying to do TikTok Live, just browsing down the street and getting oranges, and I was blocked. And Instagram also. So of course, you don't want to stir the pot, and you want to, of course, be respectful to, to society and everything around you. But I feel like that's a big challenge nowadays in 2023 and going forward, because I appreciate that we can have conversation like this in the United States Institute of Peace of Washington, D.C., but I just wish it wasn't like that back there in Vietnam. So just what's your opinion on, on this? I, I have a very simplistic answer. And, and this very is much. very simplistic. <laughs> going to Vietnam is like going to my two uncles' house where I do not agree with their politics. I do not agree with their viewpoints. I think some things that they do are wrong. But for the future of my family, I'm going to take it easy, one step at a time. I can still do things that I want in my house. I can write my own book. I can broadcast my own podcast. I can do whatever I want in my own house. And I will continue to do that strongly. But I'm not going to bash my uncle's house. I will slowly work within 
going back to my uncle and just listening and slowly the change will happen. Uh, other people are more fierce about it. I have friends who are just more militant about it. That's their style. But my very simplistic answer is when I go to my uncle's house, I respect my uncle. I don't agree with my uncle, but I respect it. But hopefully by me being there over time, my uncles will change their mind by my presence. And that's a very simple way to look at it. It reminds me of when I've been on a CNN to talk about the normalized relation with Vietnam and lip embargoes or not. And the one group say, no, we won't do that unless we have human rights. Myself, I am in humanitarian right. I don't understand about human rights too much, but I understand that if people die, I come and bowl with noodles. If they're sick, they need medicines, I'm able to help them. That is what is all about this life on this earth. And therefore, if you like can say, we cannot tell other people what to do. That is what politics does, politician does. That is what people like ambassador does. Our job is to do what is to help others the best that we can and let them be who they are. We can't change them unless they have to change themselves. If we cannot change over here, how can we change there? So, If I may, there, there are a lot of conversations going on in Vietnam all the time about, about every issue, right? People are very interested and involved in politics and society. It's not all public. Uh, but in one sense, uh, the fact that authorities feel that they need to take steps to limit it shows how far it's gone um, and what the potential is for, uh, for that conversation to continue. So. I'd like to add two more points. Uh, I, I recently discovered uh, a guest that I had on the podcast, and she said it uh, in the 90s, 94. She worked for the Canadian government, was sent back, uh, a, a delegation was sent back from Canada to figure out how to create a capitalist system for the communist government. The communists welcomed them in 1994 to figure out how capitalism can play side by side with the communist system. That is happening in, in 94, and we're not even aware that that's happening. So these changes are happening inside. Another prime example is Fulbright University. Uh, Fulbright University, uh, they sent the delegation also a good, I'm not sure how many years ago, but maybe 10 years ago, to the East Coast, to the Ivy League schools. And they toured around and they figured how can we introduce academic freedom without disrupting too much the society? So Fulbright sits inside of Saigon as an academic freedom place, uh, so where it can, it can create. But these changes are so slow that we're not gonna see it right away. So these things are being worked on when we're not seeing it. So I think, rest, be rest assured, Vietnam wants to catch up and be uh, part of the, the world game, but it's gonna take them their own way without completely disrupting society. So they still have to find their balance. So my uncle's house is my uncle's house, and I will allow my uncle to do his business, and I'll do my, my business here in the US. Time for one more. The very back. Well, two more. We can take two more. Hello, thank you. Um, it was really informative hearing you all's um, perspectives. Um, I work for Peace Corps, and Peace Corps just recently opened um, our post in Vietnam. And I wanted to know what role can individuals that might not know have an extensive uh, understanding of Vietnam and American history, how can we contribute to reconciliation, um, especially working in remote areas in Vietnam? Thanks. Can we pass that to Lum first. Sure. Um, well, first, thank you very much for your interest in, in, in serving for Peace Corps, especially uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, I, think, I think it's, uh, it's very simple, just, just going there, doing your job, showing the people that you're really there to help. And uh, with many, many individuals like you, the, 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 the process of reconciliation will just accelerate. So. Back. Hello. Um, so a bit of um, thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, honor of the 
introductions and discussion on the past and future and the reconciliation of Vietnam. Uh, very grateful for that. Um, a little bit of introduction to my background. I'm Phu Hien. I, uh, I'm currently a fellow of YC Lee Exchange Program funded by State Department. So I'm currently staying here working with one uh, government agency of Washington for one month. And uh, I'm also currently a student of Phun Prai University in Vietnam uh, for the Master of Public Policy. So there's a lot of discussions in Vietnam that uh, I can participate in and hear of about the relationship between Vietnam and US. And um, like you said, uh, it's very active. It's maybe not official, but uh, people are free to discuss on a lot of the uh, subjects. And people in Vietnam, they care a lot about the relationship, uh, the image of Vietnam in international, uh, in international politics. Um, it's uh, sometimes, like for example, alumni of Phun Pride, they can be everywhere. They are involved in politics. The previous uh, prime minister and uh, president of Vietnam are Phun Pride alumni, but no one knows about that. So we, as uh, people, Vietnamese, we are practical, but also we are very weak on promoting our image and we have some fear on uh, pushing out uh, to people uh, what we are. And thus, as a nation, I observe that uh, we are also uh, um, hesitant to push our image our. And some of the time, most of the time, problem between nations uh, arise from misunderstanding from isolation of information. So uh, from your point of view, for us, for this generation, new generation, for the future, what we can do to make, uh, for Vietnamese, to make the uh, US understand Vietnam more, and for Vietnamese in American, to make Vietnam understand US more. Um. For my last 35 years of the travel back and forth and bring a lot of uh, different groups, there's volunteers to do the work. Um, that is one way to get the two cultures to understand one another. Um, remember when young uh, men went to Vietnam back in 1965 to 75, many of them never have a chance to get to know Vietnamese. And or even, you know, have uh, never see Vietnamese really on till they maybe uh, after seventy five. Um, I did a guy uh, who um, the war ended in nineteen seventy five, and I met him like fifteen years ago, and he said, "I'm I'm the first Vietnamese he see. He never know what it looked like." That is how difficult it was to talk about the, the how you can learn one another. So the best way is to get a backpack and get a group of people go to Vietnam. Most is, best as you can, young, old, it doesn't matter. Just go there and enjoy the food. And, you know, talk to everybody, be friendly to everyone. They just want you to have a happy face, show them. You don't have to give them anything, you don't have to do anything, but just be there. You will gain and you will appreciate their culture, their motherland, and you come back and you tell your friend, you tell your family, and that is how we start to ball rolling. And, and I want to add to Ko Lee. Uh, there's this, I think, underrated um, idea of soft power, especially in entertainment. So V-pop, uh, Viet Rap, um, Vietnam Society here in DC, the Viet Film Festival in Orange County, all of these soft power groups are doing the work over time, pushing out over time, um, communities are getting together. And there are people that are creating in Hollywood, Vietnamese Americans, that, there's hundreds of them creating stories. There are hundreds of them that are acting, producing, directing in Hollywood. And going back to Vietnam, to Dring A, to hand off 
the, the work of, of filmmaking. So the soft power is happening in, in both directions. So it's just a matter of time, I believe. I, I agree. I, I think there's already so much uh, good work going on right now. So I think just a matter of time, and, and, and we see and see uh, some great fruits of our labor. Yeah, it's a good time to be Vietnamese. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so to conclude tonight's session, uh, we've invited Ambassador Ted Osius, uh, who served in Vietnam several times during his career and practiced bicycle diplomacy and people-to-people -people outreach. Uh, and has written about the history and uh, current state of U.S.-Vietnam uh, relations. Uh, Ted, would you like to sum up and offer your own comments on what we've discussed this evening? Uh, first, uh, let me say uh, thank you to Aaron and Peter, and thank you to you, Andrew, for organizing uh, a unique discussion, a discussion that couldn't have taken place even 10 years ago. And thank you to um, all three panelists. And I have a little story that I think will uh, help you understand th the way I feel about what our panelists just said. Uh, Pete Peterson was the first US ambassador to Vietnam. And at one point, somebody kind of clapped him on the back and said, it's a miracle that we've come so far in our relationship. And he got angry. He said, it's not a miracle. It's the result of courage and goodwill and commitment on the part of people. It didn't fall from heaven. And I think you're looking at people of courage, goodwill, and commitment who uh, believe that reconciliation, the process of reconciliation, is in the interest of the family. And I talk about the family in a very broad sense. We heard a lot of language uh, from uh, the panelists about family. We heard about divorce, that, you know, mom and dad are divorced and the, the kids have to deal with both sides, mom and dad being the US and Vietnam, or mom and dad being Vietnamese Americans who are in favor of reconciliation and those who are not, and the very different views that some of them have about reconciliation. Um, we heard uh, from Zao Su Lom, M. Lom, about the concept of home and how that's sometimes hard for the immigrant. We've, in the past, those of us who've read Viet Thanh Nguyen, he writes a lot about the concept of home and that's not always an easy concept for those who've been displaced. Those are part of, who, those who are part of a diaspora. We heard about the plenitude of storytelling. And I, I am a, a firm believer that whether it's Lei Li telling her story or others through film, through art, through music, telling their stories, through literature, telling their stories, that's actually a lot more helpful in some ways than, uh, than all, all the data or treatises or anything like that. The storytelling is a very human thing to do, and we as humans are, are, are programmed to understand stories and, and to react positively to stories. We heard from a number of the panelists about the importance of education. And Fulbright, of course, was cited as, as one of those. I would just note that uh, once as ambassador, I went to, uh, to, to Texas, to Houston. Um, and a lot of the uh, people of, who are part of the Komdom Ngai Mi at the Vietnamese community, and Houston had called for me to be re recalled from uh, my job. I asked John Kerry to pull me back. Because, uh, because they thought, you know, I'm too, too friendly to the communists. Um, it sounds familiar lately, doesn't it? Um, and, and, but at the end, I made a kind of a pitch on reconciliation and why I thought reconciliation uh, was better than, than the alternative. And at the end of this discussion with a, a pretty critical community, uh, one woman, a person of, uh, courage and commitment stood up and said, what can we do to help? And my answer was very simple. If you can contribute to education 
and to making sure that we learn more about each other, that's the best way to help. It's not political. Uh, we heard about respect. This is uh, a respect for those who can't move on from a painful past. For some, it's just too difficult. And we gotta respect, we gotta respect folks where they are because some people have suffered too much to talk about reconciliation and forgiveness. We heard about forgiveness, uh, especially, I mean, there's no greater embodiment of forgiveness than Lely Hayslip, who has been through terrible things, but had chosen the, you know, the kind of life I want to have, I'm going to forgive. Uh, and that is something that I think we can uh, admire and maybe try to emulate. Um, we heard, and this actually, I've thought a lot about reconciliation. I wrote a book about reconciliation, and I thank you for citing it. Um, but what I had never really thought about uh, was, and, and Long talked about this, was the role of Buddhism in enabling uh, people to, to forgive and to, to reconcile. Uh, and then we heard about some of the ways that people have been brought together through Wysili and the Peace Corps, through VPOP and Viet Rap, the work of the Vietnam Society, and just putting on backpacks and, and going to Vietnam and eating the food and talking to people. Um, I, 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 I didn't try to sum up, because there's no way to sum up such a rich conversation, but I felt that those were some of the themes that came out of it. And uh, I really want to thank uh, people of courage and goodwill and commitment for what they're willing to do, their, their willingness to stand up for reconciliation. Thank you.